Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the gift of life, even the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus, your son. Thank you, Christ Jesus, for the gift of eternal life, Lord, and forgiveness of sin, Lord. Thank you that you, by your death, burial, and resurrection, that you have forgiven all of our sins and clothed us in your righteousness and presented us into the presence of our Father. We just give you thanks. We want to take this time to thank you uh, for bringing us out of darkness into your marvelous light, for thank you, to thank you how you have protected us all of our lives and how you provided for us all of our lives. You've kept us even to this day. And so we want to worship you and honor you and thank you today. We want to thank you for the intimacy of your presence in the sanctuary today. And we want to ask you that you would magnify your words. We ask you that you'd magnify your sayings into our hearts this day. And that you would use your words to edify us, to build us up, to help us to learn how to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. We pray that you help us to walk in a way that brings forth good fruit. We pray that you would teach us how to behave as children of your great kingdom. We pray that you would use your sayings and your words today to magnify yourself in our hearts so that you might be honored and that you might get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On uh, January 2nd, 2022, I began to speak on this passage in the Bible that we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest written sermon Jesus preached in the Bible. This sermon takes up Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Well, today is December 3rd, 2023. So although this passage is only three chapters long, with my speaking rotation of once a month here at the Bible Tabernacle, it's taken me two years to come to this final lesson today. And it's interesting how that Jesus began this sermon in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, uh, with a blessing. And then he ends this sermon today in Matthew 7, 26 and 27, with a curse. All through Matthew chapter 7, there's been a theme on judging. Jesus taught us in Matthew 7 1 to judge not, that ye be not judged. Yet in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus taught us that we're to judge who are dogs and swine. In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus taught us how to judge those who are false prophets. He told us that we can know them by their fruit meaning we can know them by the doctrine that they teach. Then in verses 21 through 23, Jesus revealed himself as the divine judge, the one who determines who's going to enter into his kingdom. Now this morning here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus continues his theme of judgment. Jesus is going to challenge every person to judge where they're going to spend eternity. 
This lesson carries a very strong evangelism term. This tone is evangelistic. Let me read this passage, and then we'll go back and unpack what Jesus is saying. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain came, the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So now, beginning here in Matthew seven twenty four, where Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings, or words, of mine, Jesus is referring to all that Jesus had previously said in his sermon. Yet there's this picture of what Jesus had just been teaching on concerning judgment. Because he's calling us to judge between a wise man and a fool. So there's this large picture of the whole sermon, but then it narrows down to this particular passage about the wise man and the fool. And the way that we're to judge who a wise man or a fool is going to be determined by the hearing and doing of Jesus' words. That's what's going to determine who is the wise man and who is the fool. It's by the hearing and the doing of Jesus' words. So the main focus here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, is on this statement, these sayings of mine. In other translations, we'll say, these words of mine. Now, these are the same words that are being heard by both the wise man and the fool. These words, same words of Jesus, are being heard by the wise man and the fool. Now what distinguishes the wise man from the fool, it lies in the doing and the not doing. So when we hear Jesus' words, then everything depends on whether we do what Jesus tells us to do that's going to separate the wise from the fool. That this doing of God's word can't be accomplished by our own natural power. And that would be behaving like the scribes and the Pharisees, who even though they heard the word, they didn't do it. And now their works were the works of self-righteousness. So doing this passage... It, it, it certainly implies that some kind of works are being done. It, 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 but the doing of Christ's works, it, it's best understood in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, where uh, Jesus uh, said, repent and believe in the gospel. These are the works that Jesus is speaking about. Repent and believe the gospel. So essentially, this doing is a work of faith. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's look at, let's look at what Jesus told the people over in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, uh, verses 28 and 29. 
He says, well, let's start, let, let's go back for a minute so we can understand the context of what Jesus is saying. These people had been following Jesus around because they were, they wanted some food. He had fed, just finished feeding 5,000 people and they were, they followed him all the way from one area to another just to, just to get some food and, and, uh, they asked this question to Jesus. He says, what, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus replied to him, he says, this is the work of God that ye believe on him who has sent me. And so this works that, he's, that we're talking about here, these works are a work of faith. This, this, this doing of the words of Jesus is, is a whole life of faith, including confession, repentance, and this new obedience. This is the works of faith. This is the works that Jesus is teaching. And these type of works comes by grace through faith by the power of God's word. Not our own, certainly not by human works. Certainly not accomplished in our own ability. Only by grace to faith. So now here in Matthew chapter 7, 24, Jesus tells us, the person who hears and does Jesus' sayings, that person will be made like the wise man that Jesus describes that built his house on a rock. Now what makes this wise man wise, or this man wise, lies in his being sensible enough to choose the rock for his foundation. Now the Greek word for rock, it has two different words. One is petros which means it's, it's a masculine word. It means it describes a, a large boulder, Petros. The other word is Petra. It's a feminine word. And it describes a great rock formation in, in, in a cliff or on a ridge like, in, like an overhang or, or a natural cave-like structure. Jesus is using the word Petra, the feminine word, Petra. And so by doing that, Jesus is giving us a picture of a place of refuge, you know, a, a, a large cave or an overhang, a shelter, a, a, a place of, of shelter from, from rain and wind, a, a place that's high enough that it won't flood. In fact, this particular rain we begin to talk about it, wasn't just an ordinary rain, but a torrent or a strong downpour. Jesus tells us that there was so much rain, it began to flood. Moreover, Jesus describes the wind as being so powerful that it blew and it beat upon this house. And this house represents our faith. So the roof, the foundation, and the sides of the house were all tested. So the question is, does God test us? Well, the answer is right here in this passage. Who makes it rain? Who makes it, who makes it flood? Who drives the wind? God. Does God test us? Yes. And what, what is it that he tests? Our faith. Now, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter. Uh, verses, uh, for chapter 1, verses 6, 6 through 9 here. <laughs> 
Peter's writing here in verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. These are tests. Manifold temptations. These are tests. That the trial or the, the test of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be Trust or tried by fire or tested by fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your what? Faith, even the salvation of your souls. So it's through the testing of our faith that reveals if salvation of our soul is, is, is genuine or not. And I, I have, to, have to, I remember somewhere in, in one of Paul's letters when he talks about sincere, this word sincere, and it, and it means in the Greek language, in the Greek vernacular about this word sincere means to be tested by light. And, 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 and what they did back in the time of Jesus, they made this really fine pottery, really thin, really, really delicate pottery. And uh, it was very expensive to make. It was very expensive to buy. And every now and then, sometimes th that a little crack would appear in the, in the pottery. So they would paint it over so people couldn't see the crack. So the only way that you could see if this was a genuine piece that was, that was perfect is hold it up to the light. And, and, and it would expose the cracks. So it was tested by light. Well, we're tested by light, aren't we? And we're tested by the light of Christ Jesus who shines in our lives. So... Uh, and doesn't 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tell us to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is a matter of eternal life and death we're talking about. Is your house built on faith in Christ? In, 2, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Apostle Paul describes Jesus Christ as that rock. So when the storm and the flood and the wind test you, does your house stand? You're being tested. Jesus tells us here in verse 25 that the wise man's house, what? Fell not. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. It's the rock that saves the house. It's the rock that receives all the credit. So what made this man wise is that he understood what the rock was going to do for his house. This house is best to be understood as being a person's life. Are our lives being founded on a rock, on the rock? Jesus is the rock. These words are the rock. And all through the, the Old Testament, the rock represents uh, many things, and they all point to the Lord. Now, the book of Psalms especially is filled with verses describing the Lord as the rock of salvation, a, 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 a place of refuge. Psalm 18, 2 tells us, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength, and in whom will I trust? My buckler, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. When I, when I look at this word high tower, it represents to me a place high enough that's not going to be flooded. 
Psalm 91 2 tells us, I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Isaiah 17 10 describes God as the rock of strength. Isaiah 28, 16 describes Jesus himself as a foundational stone, a precious cornerstone. Let me read Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, he's just speaking to Jesus, a tried stone, a, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste to you. See how believing in the Lord is related to the stone, believing in the stone, believing in the rock, faith in the rock at all fits together. Having faith in the rock, having faith in Jesus, this is a matter of eternal life or death. Having faith in Jesus. This is, a, this is, this is why I say this is an evangelistic message. Jesus is giving himself this evangelistic message. Um, Jesus Christ is the... Jesus uses the word rock to describe the truth of Peter's confession. Jesus uses this word rock to describe Peter's confession. When Peter confessed to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus told Peter, and upon this rock, Meaning this great truth. So now Jesus is describing the rock as truth. Upon this, upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is describing a great foundational truth. Jesus speaks of himself here, and it's interesting, as the builder. What do you say? Upon this rock, I will build my church. He speaks of himself here as the builder. He doesn't call himself the foundation. But he made the rock or the truth the foundation. The truth is, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yet, we read in Scripture where Jesus is the cornerstone. We just read a passage here. The same stone that Peter describes in, in 1 Peter 2, um, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Peter describes it, this right here. He says, To whom coming as unto a living stone... Speaking of Jesus, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Here we go, believing, have faith in him. But unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. Stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. Now, looking back here to uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 7 and uh, verse 25. Are. 
this violent, raging storm. It represents the supreme tribulation of death. This storm isn't like a common storm, like the storms of life that, that we all go through at times. We all have storms in our lives. We all, all, we, we all have some, 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 some conflicts and things that go on in our life. We all have storms, illnesses, relationships, you know, storms we have in our life. No. This storm wasn't like that. This storm, if we fail to prepare for this particular storm, it leads to eternal death. Now here in verse 26, there's, a, there's only a slight change in what Jesus had been saying. There's only a slight change, but, but Jesus is going to tell us that the outcome is completely opposite. Let me read verses 26 and 27. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. There's a change, right? He says, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall thereof. So, it was only a slight change. Because the sayings were the same. And uh, the hearings are the same. In fact, the rain, and the flood, and the wind are all the same. But it was the doing that failed. So Jesus places this person, although he heard all about the rain and the winds of the flood, he didn't do it. The same sayings, the same words. He heard the same words that the wise man heard. He experienced the same rain and the flood and the storm that the wise man experienced. He wouldn't do it. Jesus places this person in the same class as a fool. Which, by the way, was one of the harshest insults a Jew could give to someone. It's like calling someone ignorant or stupid. Now, this is the same Greek word Jesus used back in Matthew 5.22, warning us that calling our brother a fool can put us in danger of hell fire, which is exactly the destination of this man who builds his house on sand. So no matter how sensible that person might be uh, in his daily affairs, you know, like his business, might be very wise, smart in his business, his family, good, nice family, his friends, lots of friends. After hearing the words of Jesus, after being told about the rock in the sand, he still built his whole life and eternal destiny on nothing but the sand. Of course, you know, building your house on sand is the is easier way. You know, the rock, this rocky cliff, this ledge, this shelter... It's, 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 it was higher up and it was more difficult to reach. Jesus told us it's not easy to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not easy. The rock was higher up, more difficult to reach than that smooth sand 
down in the valley. You know, we have this so-called Christian culture today teaching us a doctrine we call easy believism. Some believe that just because you prayed a prayer, you're saved. They really believe that. Some others believe that water baptism saves you. Well, we know that's not true. Others believe that because you're a good person doing good works, Jesus said there's no, none good, no, not one, but they believe that because they're a good person and they're doing good works that they're saved. And then there are those that believe in Jesus Christ intellectually. Oh, they know, all over the beach you hear people tell me they know Jesus. Well, whoop de doo so does Satan. They know Jesus intellectually, but in their heart, they haven't surrendered. They believe they're saved. And all of those people who follow these kind of doctrines are building their house on sinking sand. Is that song? <laughs> I had some. Sweet. <laughs> ground is sinking sand. Amen. A common sense ought to tell you not to build your house on sand. That's why Jesus calls this man foolish. Now there's a simple definition for the word sand here. And that's all teachings and doctrines that are not the sayings of Jesus. Anything that is not the saying of Jesus is foolish. All other ground is what you're singing, sinking sand. And those false preachers and false teachers Jesus spoke of in Matthew 7, 15, that we had looked at previously, they're like real estate agents selling you some popular real estate. It's something that's easy to build on. Like some of these motivational preachers. You know, who are, who's, who are teaching uh, man-centered and people-pleasing messages. Feeding on the emotions of their congregation. Never addressing Repentance of sin, never dealing with the fact of eternal death, but just love, 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 love. Everything is love. No, my brothers and sisters, everything is love and so is eternal death. There's people that have been in churches for 40 years and aren't saved. There's people that have gone to church and sitting in the pews for 30 or 40 years. And they just hear the word of God. But they're not saved. Doesn't that describe a person who's built their house on sand? And sometimes these sandy sites are, are even near the rock. So on the outside, they may even look the same. But on the inside, they're built different. And while the sun is shining and everything is just fine, and, and, and even when there's a moderate rain and the winds that, that represent common trials, this house that's built on sand, it might be safe. You know, it might, it might endure a little suffering. But many times, these, even the moderating storms cause some damage. Even time, these, this house that's built on sand, even the moderate storms can cause some damage. 
But that could be a good thing if it exposes the foolishness and drives that person to seek the rock. But this strong torrent of rain, flood, and wind describes the final test of eternal life or eternal death. And so Jesus is painting a picture of the man who built his house on the rock that withstood the pounding winds and the water. While the house on the sand gave way as a storm pounded against its foundation, and what did it do? It fell. This is a height of tragedy. Because Jesus says, and great was the fall. Jesus' final statement here describes a reverberating crash and an utter wreck. Turtle roaring, swept away by this raging flood. Even the sand on which the structure was built on was swept away by the tide. It was with these words that Jesus closed his sermon. Now perhaps the people were expecting Jesus to say something else. Maybe they were just waiting and expected Jesus to close his sermon the same way he begun, you know, with a blessing. But soon they began to realize his last words were a curse and a mighty warning to everyone that was in the crowd. And the effect must have been exactly what Matthew describes in verse 28. Matthew describes it, it says, and it came to pass. And by the way, Matthew was more likely right in the crowd that day. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Think about this. All through this very long sermon, as long as Jesus was speaking, every eye, every ear was fixed on every single word that Jesus was speaking. But when that voice silenced, when that voice became silent, that same voice that, that had been holding them spellbound became silent. There was a sense of amazement that swept over them. And this word here, amazed, it means to be dumbfounded. They were dumbfounded. And Matthew makes it clear that they were amazed at the doctrine But Matthew becomes even more specific because what shook the hearts and the minds of these people was the authority. The authoritative power of the teaching, of the doctrine. This made it personal. Jesus was teaching them as though he had full authoritative power as God. Jesus was revealing himself as deity, God, the Son of God, and it came out with overwhelming force. They were dumbfounded. This authoritative teaching, it wasn't like that of the scribes and the Pharisees. By the way, who only quoted what someone else told them who heard it from someone who heard it from Moses. This teaching wasn't like that. No, my friends, this was God in the flesh speaking and teaching from his own authority. So his sayings or words are speaking to you and I through the Bible today. The same full authoritative power is speaking to you and I today. And warning us not to only, not, not only to hear his sayings, but also to do them. 
so that we might be like the wise man who built his house on a rock. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God, for your word ministering to our hearts. Magnify your words, Lord. Magnify your sayings in our life, Lord, that we will build our house upon that rock, that we might be like the wise man, Lord, and not the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Father, thank you, Lord, that you've opened up our hearts and our minds and our understanding to your word so that we might live, live in, a, in a way that, that honors you. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.